All right, I am now recording this class session. It is uh, April 21st at 10 a.m. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, a couple things I want to remind you of. Your, uh, you have a test a week from today. A week from today, you're going to have an online test similar to the one that you took last time. And you'll have two opportunities to take that exam. The higher score will be recorded. I'm sure that all of you went in after the last test and noticed that your most of you, if not everybody, your grades went up at least a little bit uh, because I did go in and I regraded the test to give partial credit where uh, the computer might not have done that. I will do the same for your test next Tuesday. Um, so I wanna remind you also that next Tuesday we will not have a Zoom meeting. We will simply have the test. It'll go live at uh, midnight on the, 20, uh, the 28th, and you'll have 24 hours to get that done. Chris, what will your structure be for SI, just as a reminder to everybody? I'm thinking uh, Monday uh, during the day. Uh, so actually, if there's any way people could give me like a preference of the morning or afternoon, um, I, if anybody wants to just throw me an email, what would be better? And I could see what the consensus is for everybody, but that would be good for me. Monday, after late afternoon and evening, I have classes uh, through Zoom, but in the morning and early afternoon, we can do it whenever is good for everybody. Cool. Also, I just want to throw this out there um, that if anybody wants to meet with me individually and have a private Zoom meeting, um, you can reach out and we can set up an appointment to do that as well. Think of it as office hours, you know, uh, so we can certainly do that. Um, just informationally to make sure I've got everybody. Um, and again, your attendance that I'm recording is simply to know who's coming to the Zoom meetings. It is not impacting your grade. But uh, as of uh, what I've got written here this morning, uh, this is who is here. Ahmad, Jill, Melanie, Nina, Leslie, Chuck, Judy, Ryan, Jordan, Rena, Gabby, Michaela, Regina, uh, Christine, sorry, Christine, and um, Elisa, Eliza, I'm sorry, I keep mispronouncing that. If I missed anybody, let me know. All right, um, and you can let me know in the group chat over to the side. You can type your any messages in the group chat if you want to, or you can also send me a private message uh, if you would like. So we're going to jump into section 14.1. And as I said, I did uh, post some notes. I'm going to share that um, set of notes for 14.1. And we're going to look at that. So hopefully, give me confirmation. Are you seeing that uh, section 14.1 that says organizing data? Chris, do you see that? Yep, we got it. Cool. Awesome. Great. Again, I want to remind you that um, the image screen that has your pictures is minimized for me right now. So if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat or you can just unmute yourself and say, Mr. Becker, I have a question and I will stop. Do not feel shy about interrupting me. There is no uh, issue with that. So our lesson today is going to be 14.1 and 14.2. And the section in 14.1 is going to be very, very short. There's actually only one concept that we need to take from 14.1, and that is how to create um, and organize our data in what we call a frequency table. And we talk about frequency tables over on page 722 in your book. You can reference that as well. Again, I will show you just uh, I do have the book online so I want to make sure that I share that with you as well that's 721 so let me go to the next page so when we talk about frequency tables we're actually talking about this concept here okay first of all when I talk about data I'm simply talking about a collection of information you all know what data is I think okay and we want to understand how to organize that data in what we call a frequency table. So here we are back on this picture. What is a frequency table? Well, very simply put, it's a two-column table that tells us how, how often different outcomes from a set of data 
occur. So let me give you a simple example, all right? Now there are 23 people in our class, but let's just use the number 20 for nice round figures. So let's say that I give a quiz to you guys. It's a 10 point quiz, all right? And let's say that 20 of you show up for class. So there's 20 students that take this 10 point quiz. And here are the results, okay? So these are the scores that the 20 people got on the, the 10 point quiz. And I put them in numerical order. So there were a couple of sixes, there were some sevens, there were some eights, there were some nines, and there was one 10. Okay, so these are the outcomes that 20 students got on my 10 point quiz. All right, so like I said, two students received six points, three students got seven, there were seven students who got eight points, another seven students who received nine points, and one student got 10 points. Creating a frequency table. It's a two column table. On the left, we put the value, okay? Or in this case, that value represents the score that students got. So the scores that students got were six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Those were the only grades that were received were sixes, sevens, eights, nines, and tens. And then in the right-hand column, we put how many students got each of these scores. In other words, how frequently did a six occur? All right, so if we look up at the table, or at the, at, the, uh, at the list of scores, we see that two students got a six, three students got a seven, there were seven students that got eights, there were seven more students that got nines, and then one student got a 10. And so I put the frequency that those occurred in, in the right-hand column. So the left-hand column is your score, and by the way, uh, we're going to, when we get into 14.2, these scores are going to be referred to as our X values, okay? And the frequency, now these are not ordered pairs, the frequency is not a Y, the frequency we're going to call the letter F stands for frequency, how frequently did it occur. So these are the X's and these are the F's, these are the values and these are how often they occurred. And of course there's a total of 20 scores, okay? Now, if we look at example one on page 722 in our book, and I'm gonna to go to that here in just a minute, we're gonna use a table to summarize TV program evaluations, okay? So I'm gonna go over there just to show you that image in the book here for a moment. So in our book on page 722, at the bottom, it says, assume that 25 viewers were surveyed to evaluate a preview of an episode of NCIS. Okay, and the possible evaluations that are given are E for excellent, A for above average, V for average, B for below average, and P for poor. All right, and then at the top of uh, the next page, we see all of the possible uh, evaluations, all of the 25 evaluations. There's an A, a couple of B, Vs, a B, P, E, A, and so forth. So we want to construct a frequency table it says also, and a relative frequency table. I'll address that in a minute. We want to create, construct a frequency table for this list of evaluations. How often did each score occur? So let's go ahead and look at that information over here, okay? I've just copied the information from the book. And where did my, oh, for some reason it skipped, it dropped down a page, there we go, pull it back up, okay. So these are the exact same scores that were represented in the book, the 25 scores. So we know that the possible outcomes are E, A, V, B, and P. Okay, excellent, above average, average, below average, and poor. A frequency table would be how many times did we see the letter E up here? How many times did we see the letter A, V, B, and P, and so forth, okay? And then by organizing the data in this table, we can see the distribution of favorable and unfavorable evaluations. So in other words, if the producers of NCIS were looking at this, they would notice that there are 11 people who had them rated at least above average. And there were six people who had them rated below average or worse, and there were only eight, there were eight people who thought it was average. They can get information from this, okay? Now, the one thing that I want you to understand is that we are not going to discuss relative frequency tables, okay? Relative frequency tables refer to the uh, 
probability that a score is selected from that category. So for example, um, if four out of 25 rated NCIS as excellent, that probability would be the fraction four out of 25, which is 16%. That focuses on probability. And because of the extended spring break, we had to omit chapter 13. So anything relative to, <laughs> no pun intended, anything related to or relative to chapter 13, we're omitting. So we are not going to do anything with relative frequency tables. So if a problem appears in your homework practice problems that involve relative frequency, you can ignore them. Uh, there will not be any problems with relative frequency. If a, if a problem that involves relative frequency were to accidentally sneak into your test next week, I would not count it wrong because we're not going to talk about relative frequency. Okay, so all we care about in 14.1 is creating a frequency table. All right, that's it. And it's pretty simple. You just look at the values they give you. You put those values or scores in the left-hand column. You put the number of times those scores occur in the right-hand column, and you've created a frequency table. Pretty simple. Are there any questions about that? Okay, then we're gonna move into 14.2. Hang on a second. I see Braden is here. I want to make sure I get him down. We're going to move into section 14.2, and this is where we're going to focus the rest of our discussion. We need these dis uh, frequency distribution tables in order to solve the problems in section 14.2. So, oh, hang on a second. That is not the image that I want. I wanted 14.2. Uh, I keep getting 14.1 showing up on my screen. Hang on a second. Okay, are you guys seeing the screen that says section 14.2 measures of central tendency? Yes, okay, good. All right. So um, when we collect data, which is just a fancy way of saying information, if we collect information about things, um, that information can fall across a broad range of um, values. So for example, let's say that uh, we were going to find out, you know, information about how old the students are in our class. And there are 23 students in the class. We'll throw Chris and me in there just for, uh, for good measure. That'll be 25 people. And uh, we want to collect the information about how old everybody is. And there's probably a couple of 18 year olds. There's probably a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year olds. There's a few of us that are a little older than that in our later 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. But anyway, when we collect that data, we can look at it in a variety of different ways. We can look at the way the data spreads out from the lowest number to the highest number, which is something we're actually going to talk about on Thursday. Or we can look at the way the data tends to collect in the middle, okay? And when we consider this data that's in the middle, what we're looking at are measures of central tendency. Now, you know what tendency means. Tendency means the likelihood of something occurring. You know that central means in the middle. So we're talking about the measures that kind of tend to occur in the middle, okay? And there are three principal measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode the three M's, if you will. Again, if anybody needs clarification or if you need me to slow down a little bit, just let me know, all right? We're going to look first at the mean. And the mean is the one that we most commonly understand uh, in measures of central tendency. It's the one that you guys probably learned first from a very early age because another word for the mean is the average. Okay, and we often want to calculate our average score in a class. Now, how do we calculate an average for a simple set of data? And when I say a simple set of data, I simply mean a, a collection of numbers. How do we find the average? Well, to calculate the average for a set of numbers, we just add together those numbers. We call each number a piece of data. We add them together, and then we divide by the total number of data pieces. So we've got this example over here on the left, okay? We've got the two, two, five, six, seven, and eight. 
if we want, let's say, let's put some context to this. Let's say that I gave six people an opportunity to earn extra credit. And the extra credit points that were earned were two points and two points for someone else. And then the other four people earned five, six, seven, and eight points respectively. Well, if you add all those numbers together, two, two, five, six, seven, and eight, it adds up to 30. If you take that sum, and remember, sum can be represented by the Greek letter sigma. We'll talk about that, remind you of that a little bit. If we take the sum of 30 and we divide it by the number of scores, one, two, three, four, five, six scores, 30 divided by six equals five. So the average or the mean of those six scores is five. We took the sum, which was 30, we divided it by the number of scores, number of pieces of data, if you will, and we got five. So there is a formula for this. First of all, I want you to understand that if you see a symbol, the letter X with a bar over the top, the X with the bar over the top is the symbol for the mean, okay, or the average. So the average is found by adding together our X's. There's that Greek letter sigma. We talked about sigmas back when we did the lines of best fit earlier in the semester. I'm sure you guys remember those horrific formulas that had all the sigmas in them, okay? So we add together our X values. That's what that means right there, sigma X. And we divide it by N. N is the number of the scores. So in this previous problem, sigma X, adding all the X's together was 30. There were a total of six scores. So 30 divided by six equals five. So that's how we find the mean. Finding the mean for just a simple list of, of scores, like two, five, two, two, five, six, seven, and eight, very simple, very simple. We add the scores together, we divide by the number of scores, we get the average. And by the way, the average could be a decimal number, it could be a fraction that is not easily simplified. That's okay, the average does not have to come out to be a nice number, like five. So what I want to do now is I want to apply this concept of finding the mean to a frequency distribution, okay? So we're going to go back to this set of scores. These are the same 20 scores that we looked at in 14.1. Just as a reminder for context, 20 of you took a quiz. The results of the quizzes were that some people got sixes, some got sevens, eights, nines, and tens. These are the same exact scores as we looked at in the previous assignment. Now, you could add six plus six plus seven plus seven plus seven plus eight plus eight plus eight and so forth, but that's very cumbersome. It takes a lot of work, okay? Uh, of course, there are 20 scores, so if you added them all together and divide by 20, you'd get the result, but there is a more efficient way to find the mean for a frequency distribution, and that's what I want to look at. So we're going to take the frequency table from the previous section, Okay, this is the frequency table right here that we used originally. And what we're going to do is, and I told you this already, we're going to call each of the x or each of the scores x. That's the variable that represents the scores. And we're going to call the number of times each score occurs f. So we have x and f. And now we're going to create a third column. Okay. And in this third column, right? Oops, I was trying to highlight the third column. There we go. In this third column, we're going to multiply together the values for x and f. So in other words, 6 times 2 is 12, 7 times 3 is 21, 8 times 7 is 56, and so forth. So you can see how we got these values here by multiplying together the values in the previous two columns, in each row, I should say. And then we're going to add all of these together to get this value here. So six times two is 12, seven times three is 21. When I add the 12, 21, 56, 63, and 10 together, I get 162, okay? That's the value of the, each score times its frequency. Then we're going to take that total from the third column, and we're going to divide by the total of the frequency, which is the value in the second column. So we're gonna take that 162 points, that was the total amount that was earned, that's in the third column. We're going to divide it by 20 scores, 
and we find that the average, 162 divided by 20, is 8.1. So for this particular problem, the average score on the quiz was 8.1. Now again, there is actually no 8.1 that is an actual score that anybody received, but the overall average is 8.1. So let's go ahead and go back to the book. Let's go to uh, page 724, I think it said. It's the book. And let's take a look at, not that one, maybe it was, Hang on a second, I, I jumped the gun and I didn't see the actual number here. So let me go back here for a second and see what the number was. Oh, page 734, I'm sorry, I was off by a factor of 10. So we're gonna go back to the book, share that with you guys. You know, I've got the notes right in front of me that I'm, I keep popping up on the screen. If I were following them along, I wouldn't have had to do that. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to go to page 734. 734. And it's actually starting at the very bottom, example two, computing the mean of a frequency distribution of water temperatures. Okay, so let's look at this problem. It says that the Environmental Protection Agency suspects that hot water discharge from a nuclear power plant is responsible for a recent fish kill. To investigate this problem, the agency has recorded the water temperatures at a point downstream from the plant for the last 30 days. So the Environmental Protection Agency goes downriver from this nuclear power plant for 30 days, they record the water temperature because they wanna see if the water's too hot and it's causing fish to die, okay? It's a great example. Now they actually create what's called a histogram here. We're not gonna to focus too heavily on, I can't zoom in even a little bit. We're not gonna to focus too heavily on the idea behind creating this because you guys probably all can read a chart. I, I assume that you can read a chart. So these are the temperatures across the bottom. The water varied from 52 to 57 degrees. These are the number of days that it hit each temperature. So for example, there were four days when the water was 52 degrees. There were six days where it was 53 degrees, three days where it was 54 and so forth. And they took this information from this chart, which is called a histogram, and they created a frequency distribution. So rather than adding together 52 plus 52 plus 52 plus 52 and 53 plus 53 six times and so forth, they create the frequency distribution right here. All right, these are the temperatures. These are the number of days that each of those temperatures occurred, a total of 30 days. And then they multiply the rows together. 52 times 4 is 208 and 53 times 6 is 318, <clears throat> excuse me, and so forth. And once they've done that, they add all these scores together, 208, 318, 162, and so forth, and they get 1,637. Then they take that value, 1637, they divide it by the number of days that they collected data, which was 30, and when they do that, they get approximately 54.6. Uh, dividing by 30, it's probably a decimal number that's close to that, but not exact. So that means that the EPA knows the water on average is 54.6 degrees across that 30-day span. And if that water temperature is okay for the animals, for the fish, then they'll know, okay, it's not the temperature that's killing the fish, maybe it's something else, like, I don't know, the radioactive waste or something. But anyway, so that's how we calculate the mean for a frequency distribution. Does anybody have any questions about that? Hearing none, we will move on to the second measure of central tendency. And that is the median. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the term median. 
if you're ever driving uh, down a highway, like down I-65, they've got the northbound and the southbound traffic, and they've got this, uh, this metal barrier between the two. That's called the median, and it's in the middle. And that's what the median is. The median is simply the middle value in a set of data when you put the data in order from uh, smallest to largest. It could be largest to smallest, it doesn't really matter, but in general, we always put data in numerical value order from smallest to largest. This is important, by the way. If you don't put the numbers in numerical order, if they're just kind of scattered all over the place, then the number that's in the middle position is not actually the middle value. So the first thing that you always need to do when you're given a set of data is either put it in numerical order or make certain that it's already in numerical order, okay? Now, <clears throat> there's a little image here. The median is the middle number when the numbers are put in order. And so here's an example. The numbers 33, 35, 35, 36, 39, 40, and 42. There are two ways that you can find the middle value, particularly when you have an odd set of data, okay? This is most helpful when you have an odd number of data pieces. So here we have seven numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One way that you can find the median is to take the number of values, which in this case is seven, and add one to it. Of course, seven plus one equals eight. And then divide it by two. Eight divided by two is four. That means that the median is in the fourth position. The middle score is in the fourth position. So if you look at this data over here, you see one, two, three, four. The fourth position is 36. Pretty simple. It's got three values to the left and three values to the right. So that's one way that you can find the median. You take the number of scores plus one and divide by two. Another way that you can do it is to cross off numbers from each end. That should be from each end. I just noticed the typo. Uh, another way to find the median is to cross off numbers from each end until you get to the middle. And I've done this. I was actually pretty proud of myself. I know it's pretty simple and you guys probably think it's pretty lame, but I came up with these colored lines to show you, okay, there's the first pair. I'm going to cross those out. Then I'm going to cross out the next pair. Then I'm going to cross out the next pair. And when I keep doing that system of canceling stuff from each end, eventually I'm going to get to the middle and there's going to be a score left and that's going to be your median. All right. So on page 738 in the book, and I'm flipping over to see what my example is here. Yeah, okay. So let's go back to the book for a moment and take a look at page 738. And okay, so here's a nice question. I can never zoom in just a little bit. Anyway, so this is uh, the ages of all the presidents from Teddy Roosevelt up to President Obama, okay? And the ages obviously are different, 42, 51, 56, 55, 51, and you can see that they are not in order. So the first thing you would need to do with this problem is you would need to go through and you would need to put all these numbers in numerical order. And they do that here. The youngest president, I believe, was... Uh, well, let's see who was the youngest president. At 42, Teddy Roosevelt was the youngest president uh, when he took office, followed closely by John F. Kennedy, Bill Clinton, and then Obama. So those presidents were all in their 40s. And then we have However, presidents in their... Uh, people misconcert, uh, misconcept that, but Kennedy was the youngest elected because Roosevelt took office because McKinley was assassinated. So. Uh, you got to be careful with who is as asking the question. Very interesting, Chuck. Very interesting history lesson there. I didn't even think about that, but that does make sense. So yeah, we're talking about um, uh, their ages at inauguration. And inauguration, you know, would be if, if Roosevelt took office because of an assassination, then that's when he was inaugurated president. Very, very good, uh, good point. You know, it's funny, parenthetically, I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, for one of my online classes, I, um, we have a discussion section, and this week's discussion was not math-related. I said, um, 
do some research on President Trump's education policies and then report back on what you think of them. And, you know, whether you like Trump or don't like him, you know, he does have positions on education and has made some decisions about education, some of which people find favorable. He may not be favorable in a lot of other ways, but uh, anyway, I had a couple of students who, uh, who their answer to the discussion was, what does this have to do with math? And it's like, you know, we don't have to live in a silo where all we talk about is math. We can talk about other interesting stuff that relates to the world. And Chuck just shared that interesting piece of information. So I appreciate that. Everything so anyway, what's that? Every, everything can be related to math. <laughs> well, yes, it can actually. And I didn't want to, I was really kind of ticked off. Of course, I was grading these at seven o'clock this morning, these discussions, and I was irritable because I had, hadn't been able to sleep. So yeah, math is pretty much... Um, part of everyday life, but I wasn't gonna get into that with them. So back to this problem. Um, we've got a list of presidents. We wanna find the president uh, who's, or we wanna find the age that is in the middle. Now there are 19 presidents listed in this problem. Okay, 19 presidents, there are the scores. So you could cross them off, you could cross off the 42 and the 69 and the 43 and the 64 and so forth. You could do it from each end. Is, thank you, Christine. I appreciate that very much. That's encouraging to me. Christine said that one of her favorite things about my teaching is I share more than just math. You know, I'm not one of these professors who believes that my discipline is the center of all life in the universe. Um, so I do appreciate that encouragement. I need to hear that once in a while. Thank you. So anyway, there are 19 presidents. So again, I want to remind you, one thing we could do is we could take that number, 19, add 1, 19 plus 1 is 20, and divide by 2 is 10. That means that the age, the number in the middle or in the 10th position is our median. So here's 1, 2, 3, is that going for me? 1, okay. I'll just do it this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's the tenth position. The median is 54. So, I, I, by the way, look at the chart over here for a minute. If we just count down to the tenth position based on the order of precedence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Kennedy is actually the tenth president in this list. But his age is 43, that's not the median score, and it's because the numbers are not in numerical order. That is one of the most common mistakes that people make, is they don't put the numbers in numerical order. All right, so I wanna go back now to the notes, because the pro first couple problems we looked at <clears throat> involved odd numbers of data pieces. Up here we had seven scores, the president problem we just looked at had 19 scores, but what about when the number of data is an even number? So here we have two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 19, 20. That's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 scores. So if we add 10 plus one, we get 11. Divide 11 by two, we get 5.5. Now what that means, is that the median is between the fifth and the sixth position. One, two, three, four, five, six, it's gonna be in the middle right there. So how do you find the median for an even numbered set of scores? Well, you take those two middle scores and you find the mean of those two scores. Now remember the mean is found by adding the scores together and dividing by the number of scores. So if the two scores in the middle are seven and eight, we add seven plus eight, get 15 divided by two is seven and a half. So in this particular set of data, the median is 7.5. And notice, 7.5 is not one of the scores, and that's okay. A median for a set of scores can actually be a value that's not part of the set, okay? So it's right there smack dab in the middle. Now, another thing you could have done is you could have use the method where you cross stuff off from each end. You could have said, okay, uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Hang on a second. So you could have highlighted that and that and crossed those out. And then said, now I'm gonna cross out the second score and the second to last score 
and that score and that score and that score and that score and you get to the middle and you can't cross out the two middle scores because then you won't find the median. So you could have used this method that we used up here of crossing off numbers till we get to the middle, but you're still going to get to a position where you have two middle scores and you have to find the mean of those two scores. So whether you're crossing numbers off from each end or you're just finding the position that it's in, you're going to need to um, take the mean of the middle two scores. Very simply, just add the middle two scores together, divide by two, and that will tell you your median. Are there any questions about how to find the median for a set of data when there's an odd number of scores or an even number of scores? Okay, hearing none, what about a median for a frequency distribution? Now, by this point, you're probably getting the idea that these frequency distributions are going to be important on your final exam and on your test next week, and you would be correct. So let's go back and revisit that frequency distribution again that we talked about at the very beginning of our discussion today. Again, these are the six I'm sorry, the 20 students who took the 10 point quiz. And you remember some of them had six points, some of them got seven, some of them got eight, nine, and 10, and this is the number. So these first two columns are that frequency distribution for those students. Now, when we found the mean, we created a third column and we multiplied the six times the two and the seven times the three. Well, we create a third column again, but we're not gonna multiply the values. What we want to do when we're finding the median, this is for the median, we want to find the cumulative position of each score. Okay, median for a frequency distribution, we want to find the cumulative position. So stick with me. Let me give it to you this way. Let's say that <laughs> we would never do this, but let's say that we lined everybody up, all 20 students, we lined them up from the highest score to the lowest score, or from the lowest score to the highest score, let's put it that way, lowest score to the highest score. So we put the people who got sixes first, then the sevens, eights, nines, and tens. And then we asked you to identify the position that each person was standing in. Well, the first and the second person would be people who got sixes. And then the next three people, the third, fourth, and fifth people would be the people who got sevens. And then the next seven people, which is six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, those would be the people who got eights. The next seven people after that would be the people who got nines. And then the very last person would be the person who got a 10. So do you understand the, how we got everybody into the cumulative position? Okay, the cumulative position of each of these values. First two people got sixes, the next three people got sevens, the next seven people got eights, the next seven people got nines, and the last person got a 10. All right, now we find the position of the median the same way that we talked about previously. There are 20 scores. So we're gonna add 20 plus one and divide it by two. You can see that right down here. 20 plus one divided by two is 10.5. So in other words, if people are all lined up, the two people at the 10th and 11th position are the people in the middle. Okay, so we're gonna look at the cumulative scores and we're gonna find out where the person, where the people in the 10th and 11th positions are. And then if there were an imaginary person in the middle of them, what would their score be? Well, the 10th and the 11th position fall in this group right here. Because these are the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th people. Does that make sense? I hope. So then, we don't look at the number for the frequency, we look at the number associated with the frequency, which is eight. So the median for this set of scores, for this frequency distribution is eight, because the people in the 10th and the 11th position both got an eight. Eight plus eight is 16, 16 divided by two would be eight, so the median would be eight. We're gonna look at another frequency distribution in a moment, but I wanna pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions about that. Okay, hearing none, 
Let's look at another example. So now I've just picked some random scores, okay? There are a total of 30 scores. And the scores are 14, 20, 25, 39, 50, and 62. And we're going to find the median for these 30 scores. So again, our third column is the cumulative position. The first five scores are 14. The next four scores are 20. The next six scores are 25 and so forth. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And we want to find the median. Now I've designed this one to be a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say tricky, it's not tricky. It's not a trick question, but it's going to require a little bit more thinking. So the median is going to be 30 plus one is 31 divided by two is 15.5. So the median is going to occur between the 15th and the 16th positions. And I want you to notice that in this problem, the 15th position, the 15th score is a 25, and the 16th score is a 39. And it's going to be right in between those two. So what we have to do in order to find the median is we have to add these scores together, the 25 and the 39. Don't add the 6 and the 2. The 6 and the 2 are just telling you how many 25s and 39s there are. <coughs> Excuse me. So we add together the 25 and the 39. And when we do that, we get 64. 64 divided by, divided by 2 is 32. So the median for this frequency distribution is 32. Now I know that there is not a score of 32. That's okay. This sometimes happens when we find the median. We find a value in the middle. We have to take the average of what's going on in the middle. And so in this case, the median for this frequency distribution is 32. So this one requires a little bit more thinking. I want to pause for just a minute and give everybody a chance to uh, let it sink in. And does anybody have any questions about this? We doing okay so far, folks? I'm still here. See, still here. All right. So now we are going to go to the third measure of central tendency. <clears throat> and to be honest, this third measure of central tendency is the easiest of the three. It's called the mode, M-O-D-E, mode. And mode simply means the most frequently occurring score. You don't even have to do any computation for the mode. With the mean, we had to add numbers together and divide by the number of numbers. With the median, we could cross things off of each end, but it was possible that we were going to have to find the mean of the middle. But for the mode, all we have to do is observe. That's all it takes to figure out the mode. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as I said, the mode is, uh, simply represents the most of any score in a set of data. Whatever value occurs the most frequently is the mode. So this was one of the um, sets of numbers that we looked at early on. It was in, it was in the image when we, um, when we found the mean for that first set of numbers, I think. I don't remember where we saw this. But uh, in a previous example, we looked at these numbers, 33, 35, 35, 36, 39, 40, and 42. Clearly, there is one number that occurs more than any of the others. There's a 33, a 36, a 39, a 40, and a 42, but 35 occurs twice. Because 35 occurs more frequently than any of the other numbers, the mode for this set of data is 35. It's pretty simple. We were able to find that by observation. We did not have to do any computation. Now, it's important for you to understand when we talk about a mode, let me be able to look some of you in the eye right now. When we talk about a mode, a set of data can either have a single mode or it could have two modes. If it has two modes, we call it bimodal, bi meaning two. So you can have a, a single mode, you can have two modes. You cannot have more than two modes. So if you have any scores that occur the same number of times, like three times or four times or five times, we say that that data has no mode. 
So there will be a single mode or bimodal or no mode at all. And we're going to look at some examples of that right now. Uh, go back to this. So let's take that same set of data, the 33, 35, 35 that we used up here. Let's throw in a second 40 right there. So let's look at this, what I've highlighted here. And we'll notice that most of the numbers are the same, but there's a second 40 in there. I threw in a second score of 40. Okay, so now we have two 40s. We have two 35s. So this set of data right here has two scores that occur the same number of times more frequently than everything else. Everything else only occurs once. Those scores occur twice. So this is called bimodal. Okay, now if I threw in, I'm just doing this randomly, if I threw in another 40, now I've got three 40s. I've only got two 35s. So now the mode for this data would be just 40. All right, just so that we're clear on that. There are three scores of 40 so the, and only two of 35. So the mode for this is 40. But if we're, if we're just sitting here with uh, two 35s and two 40s, it is called bimodal. So if I asked you to find the mode for this set of data, you would list both numbers. And the answer, you would just write it as 35 comma 40. You don't find the average of them. You don't add 35 plus 40 and divide by two, anything like that. You just list both numbers. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I said, a set of data cannot have more than two modes. And the reason is because when you have more than two modes, then um, the mode is not really a significant piece of information anymore. So in that case, we say it has, as I said, no mode. So here's a set of data right here. And if you look at it, you see there are a couple of 17s. We'll just, we'll highlight things. So there's a couple of 17s. There's a couple of 19s. And there's a couple of 23s. All right. Three sets of data that, that occur this, the same number of times. 21 and 25 obviously occur less. Because there are three numbers that occur twice, this data has no mode. Now we can find the mean and the median. You know, the mean is just add them together and divide by two, four, six, eight. The median is easy because uh, if there's eight scores, it's going to occur between the um, fourth and the fifth score. Eight plus one is nine divided by two, yeah, 4.5. So it'd be right in here between the 19 and the 21. So the median for this set of data is 19 plus 21, which is 40 divided by two is 20. So this has a median of 20, uh, the mean we could calculate, but it has no mode. Any questions about that? All right, you probably saw this coming. Mode for a frequency distribution. Again, folks, this is really easy. Finding the mode for a frequency distribution is very simple, especially if the frequency distribution's already been created for you. All right, this is an example that we looked at a little bit ago when we found the median. Uh, in fact, both of these frequency tables right here are ones we've used before. So how do you find the mode for a frequency distribution? All you have to do is look down the frequency column and find the largest number. So in this frequency table, the frequency column, the largest number is eight. That means that the score associated with eight occurs more than this one. This one only occurs six times. This only occurs five times. This only occurs four times and so forth. But the score associated with this occurs eight times. So what is that score? Well, the score is 50. This is important for you to understand. The mode for this, Frequency table is not eight. Eight is the number of times that, that the number occurs. The actual mode is 50. That's a common mistake and one that you could easily make on your online test next week. If you were given a frequency table and it asked you to find the mode, you'd see the eight, you'd go eight's the highest number, so that must be the mode. Eight is associated with how many times 50 occurs, so please understand that. And going back to the very beginning, uh, when we talked about creating a frequency table, this is the table for the 20 students who took quizzes, 10-point quizzes, and got six, seven, eight, nines, and tens. 
when we look down the frequency column, there are two scores that occur the same number of times more than the others. Eight occurs seven times and nine occurs seven times. So this problem, this frequency table is bimodal because there are two scores that occur more frequently than all the others. Now those modes are eight and nine. That is, these are the modes for this table. Remember, it's not the value in the frequency column, it's the score that the frequencies are associated with. So finding the mode for a frequency distribution is really the easiest. By the way, if there had been, I'm, I'm making a change right now, folks, just for a minute, just for, to show you an example. If there had been seven students who also got sixes, okay? If we had seven, of course, I know it changes the total here. I'm gonna change this back. I'm just trying to make a point. If seven students got sixes, seven students got eights, and seven students got nines, we would say that this frequency distribution has no mode because there are more than two scores that occurred the most frequently, okay? So be aware of that. All right, so we've talked about how to find the mean for a simple set of data and a frequency distribution. We've talked about finding the median for a simple set of data and a frequency distribution. By the way, finding the median for a frequency distribution is the one that's more complicated for most people of all the concepts we talked about here. And then we've also found the mode for a simple set of data and a frequency distribution. I thought there might be more questions. Does anybody have any right now? Will we be doing any? Will we be doing anything with the range uh, this chapter? Yes. When we get into fourteen point three, which is on Thursday, <clears throat> excuse me, we will talk about the range and the standard deviation, and um, then we will talk about the normal distribution. So fourteen three and fourteen four are what we're going to discuss on Thursday. And then your test that you take on Tuesday of next week will be everything we've done since the previous test, which I believe, I'm doing this off the top of my head, I believe it's chapter 12, the counting numbers. Or wait, did you have that on the previous test? I'm thinking. Nope. No, okay. Should start with counting method. Counting math, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So chapter 12, sections one, two, and three. And then chapter 14, sections one, two, three, and four. Let me say that one more time. Your test that you take next Tuesday is going to be over 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, as well as 14.1, two, three, and four. I haven't created it yet, so I can't tell you how many questions there are. Last time I created a test, there were 35 questions. And after Chris took it, he contacted me and said, you know what, there's a couple problems on there I think are a little tricky and maybe you should consider revising. And I looked at them and he was right. So I went in and tried to revise them. And for whatever reason, my math lab would not let me revise them. So I deleted them. <laughs> I just deleted them from the, uh, the test. So that's why your last test was only 33 instead of 35 questions. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I wanna state again that I made that decision based on Chris's input. I, I take Chris's um, advice and recommendations very seriously. So. You need to understand that knowing that he knows what the test looks like ahead of time and he takes the test ahead of time and the same thing for the final. He's an incredibly valuable resource for you guys uh, in, in SI. And if you're not getting to SI and getting that, uh, using that resource, um, it's to your own detriment. That's all I'll say. Most people did pretty well in the last the electronic test. Most of you will probably do pretty well in the next electronic test, but the final exam is written. I'm gonna post it on, on Canvas and you guys are gonna print it out and take it at home. So remember that. Remember that that final exam is going to probably be a little tougher because you're going to have to do it on paper and then submit it back to me and you only get one shot. There's not multiple times to take that test. So correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I believe you have SI from like nine to 10 before class, right? So you'll probably have yeah, that again on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. 
I'll send an email either this afternoon or um, Wednesday about like a morning time or an afternoon time, what would be better for everybody for uh, for Monday's exam review. Cool. So, uh, and I can even split it up, maybe do an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, if, you know, whatever works for everybody. You know, I'm kind of uh, trapped here, so. <laughs> Aren't we all? Right. Aren't we all? Yep. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions or need any clarification? No? Okay. Well, I am ending this recording.